Yeah. All right, we're good. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Will you stand and join us in worship? Come on, can we lift our voices up in worship? We exalt you, Jesus, oh. We love you, because you never lost a battle. He is my faithful father, calling me out of the dark. I cannot whisper away what he said in the light. He is my firm foundation. My anchor won't be moved. The storms may collide, but my soul is on fire with his word. And when listen to a power on my lips. Jesus has broken the curse. He has never lost a battle. Who are you, great mountains, that you should not bow low? Jesus defeated the darkness. He has never lost. Battle. And he never will, he never will. And he never will, he never will. He is my faithful. He is my faithful father. Should not bow low. You should not 
lost the battle, you never will lose. Uh, you defeated the darkness. Uh, you defeated the darkness. Yeah. Oh, our great defender, our strong tower. He's never lost the battle. Never lost a battle. Our great defender, our strong tower. He's never lost a battle. No, he's never lost. Our great defender, our great defender. comes up, I'm going to confess into a word of prayer. Lord God, I thank you so much for this day. God, I thank you that you never lose, God, that there's nothing that can stand against you, Lord, that there is no one above you, Lord. And so, God, I thank you for your power, God. I thank you for your providence, Lord. Lord God, I thank you that you reign over us, God, and there's nothing that you cannot control, God. So I pray that today we would surrender it all to you, Lord. Lord God, we love you, God, and we praise you in your holy name. Amen. Try me now, where the grace runs as deep as your scar. You pulled me from the clay. You set me on the rock. You called me by your name. And made my heart whole again. Lift it up. to sing than to 
Grace holds me now, and that grace owns the ground with the grave, where all my shame remains, left for dead anyway. You crash those angel gates, you left no stone unturned. Stepped out of that grave, shouldered me all the way. So here I stand. So here I stand. I am surrender. I need you now. Hold my heart now and forever. My soul cries out. Cause once I was. You love my whole heart through. Sin has no hold on me, cause your grace holds me now. Healed and forgiven, but look where my chains are now. Death has no hold on me, cause your grace holds that ground. Grace holds me now, and your grace holds me now, and your grace holds me now, because your grace holds me Once I was broken, but you loved my whole heart through. Sin has no hold on me, because your grace holds me now. And healed and forgiven, but look where my chains are now. Death has no hold. Grace holds that crown, and your grace holds me now, and your grace holds me now.
to sing that again, but I want us to sing it with authority, knowing that we serve a God that is above all sicknesses, that we deserve, we serve a God that is above all fear. So I want us to decree and declare that our God reigns today, and that he won't take this away from us, he won't take our security away, the world can't take our security away from us because our God reigns. Amen. So we're going to sing that one more time. Lord God, we thank you so much for who you are, Lord. Lord God, I thank you that you reign, Lord, that there is nothing that can overcome us, God. That we are victorious in your name, God. Lord God, I thank you that you died for us, God, and that you have the victory, Lord. So Lord God, I pray that we won't walk in fear, God. That we won't walk in doubt, Lord God. That you would embolden us in your spirit, God, to be more than conquerors, Lord God. Because that's what you call us, God. So Lord God, I pray that we wouldn't walk out of shame out of who we think we are, God, but we would walk in confidence knowing that who you say we are, Lord God. So, Lord God, I pray that we would just hold that truth today so tightly, Lord God, and that when people see us, they don't see our fear, they don't see our doubt, but they see you, Lord. So, Lord God, I thank you that you cover us with your blood, God. Lord God, we are thankful, Lord, that you are worthy of our praise. In your holy name, amen. Precious Movements is coming up now.
We know the New Testament frequently rests with the topic of anger. Be angry, but do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. Put away from you all bitterness and wrath and anger. But now you must get rid of all such things. Anger, wrath, malice slander. The clicker's not working the way I want it to. There we go. You must understand. Let everyone be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger. Whoop. No, I'm not going to get angry. <laughs> Pray, lifting up holy hands without anger or argument. Clearly, anger is a dangerous thing, and in order for us to be virtuous, we must listen to these cautions. But we must also ask another insightful question, one that might cause us to pause as we get started today. Was Jesus ever angry? If so, when? Well, if you're like me, the first story in the New Testament that springs to your mind is when Jesus cleansed the temple, and I promised Dr. Mordecai I wouldn't do that today. I get a, there's too many expensive things. But that event occurs near the end of the Synoptic Gospels, the first three books of the New Testament. And in the flow of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, this action on the part of Jesus surely triggered, at least in the human sense, of crucifixion at the end of each book. But we might ask, was Jesus really angry here? On this, scholars actually disagree. You see, there are at least two options that could explain what is going on. The first is... Jesus' actions, Jesus's actions could be seen as an attempt to reform the temple by cleansing it of social injustice symbolized by the money changers. They robbed the poor. In that case, Jesus was probably angry. But Jesus' actions could simply be a prophetic, symbolic, kind of dramatic action that looked to the end of the animal sacrifice system and ultimately the destruction of the temple itself which actually came about several decades later. If this is what was happening, Jesus would be engaged in a symbolic act, actually, scholars tell us, not necessarily one out of anger, but a dramatic demonstration of what he knew was going to and should happen. So it's possible that this passage of the temple clearing does not represent Jesus being angry at all. Instead, it could be that he was merely acting out and performing a message that everyone needed to hear. But students of the Gospels do know that Jesus did get angry. And how do we know that? Well, there's a place in the biblical text where the anger is explicitly noted, and that's in Mark 3, 5. It's a verse toward the end of a scene covering more than a chapter, and we're going to look at it in a second in Mark's Gospel, and note that it appears quite early in the Gospel of Mark. It's 16 chapters. This is the third chapter, second and third chapter, and we must note that what, it, what provokes this anger in the passage. So let's look at it together, shall we? It says Mark 2, 1 through 3, 6 up there. The story covers this passage, this, this portion, and it can be broken into five sections. Whoa. Can you see it? 
Let me read it for you. It's okay. I'm not going to be using the slides very much. Mark 2, 1, 3 for, through 3, 6 is, is the portion we're talking about here. And in the first portion, we get um, Jesus healing a paralytic in, in Mark 2, 1 through 12. Now you remember the passage where there's four guys taking their paralytic uh, um, friend, and they break through the ceiling, the roof, and they lower him down. And Jesus responds, I'm not going to read the whole passage, I wouldn't have time, but Jesus responds, your sins are forgiven. And then he heals the man. I think all these are going to be a little small, so let me just explain it to you. The second one is when Jesus calls Levi. Levi is possibly Matthew, and this is in verses 13 through 17. And Levi, we're told in Mark, is a tax collector. Right? So, of course, tax collectors, if you know anything about this context, they were hated and they were despised, especially by observant Pharisees. The third portion <laughs> is in Mark 2, 18 through 22. This, is, this entails a, a question about fasting, a contrast of fasting habits between fa the Pharisees and John's disciples, John the Baptist's disciples, and Jesus' disciples, who were not fasting. The fourth portion, at the end of this chapter, is Mark 2, 23 through 28. It's the end of this chapter, and again, it's uh, working on the Sabbath, of whether or not you're, what you're supposed to do on the Sabbath. What does the Sabbath entail? And this is um, where Jesus and his disciples are picking grain and eating, which is, by the observant Jews, is considered work. Finally, we get to Mark 3, 1 through 6, and trust me, that's what it says. The man with a withered hand. And Jesus has a man stretch out his withered hand, and he heals him. Now, I'm thinking, thinking this next slide will probably be, be equally small. Yeah, let me just forego the slides and I'll, I'll, I'll work my way through it. The first portion uh, in, in Mark 2, 1 through 12, we get a question and an answer. The question is, who can forgive sins but God alone? And this is asked by the, the scribes, and the recipient of the question is Jesus. Jesus, in verse 9, answers in this way. He says, which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, stand up and take your mat and walk? But as if to show that the two are coupled together, he actually heals the man, and the man walks away. The second portion from 2.13 through 17, we get Jesus eating with the tax collectors. And the, the Pharisees ask him, why do you eat with the tax collectors and sinners? Why do you keep such company at the table? And Jesus' answer is, those who are well have no need of a physician. But those who are sick, I have come to call not the righteous, but the sinners. So again, they ask, Jesus answers. Third portion, contrasting of these fasting habits. The question from the people this time, or why is it that John's, John the Baptist disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees fast, but your, fa your disciples don't fast? And Jesus again answers, basically talking about the fact that he's there and something new is happening. In, verse, in verses 19 and 20, the wedding guests cannot fast while the bridegroom is with them. As long as they have the bridegroom with them, they will not fast. The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast on that day. The fourth time, this idea of working on the Sabbath and plucking grain, the Pharisees ask, why are you doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? And Jesus answers, the Sabbath was made for humankind and not humankind for the Sabbath, so the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Note that again, he's the one answering, they're the ones interrogating, and he centers the answer in on himself. So, so far, others have been questioning Jesus, and Jesus has been answering. Now, again, I'm going to for forego the slides altogether. Just Let's look at these five kind of couplets in each case. We've got question, answer, question, answer, question, answer. The first one starts off in verse, uh, um, I mean, in, in, in the, um, I'm sorry, let me go to the last one, the last couplet, couplet number five. Let me read verses uh, three, one through, and two. 
Again, Jesus entered the synagogue, and a man was there who had a withered hand. They watched him to see whether he would cure him on the Sabbath. Again, they're trying to see, are you going to do anything wrong? Are you working? Grilling him. So that they might accuse him. Verse 3, and he said to the man who had the withered hand, come forward. Now, from Jesus, he then is the one who asks the question, is it lawful to do good or to do harm on the Sabbath, to save life or to kill? And the Pharisees answer, but not in the way we become accustomed to. They answer, the text says, in silence. The Pharisees were silent, verse 4. And then verse 6 follows in this way. They went out and immediately conspired with the Herodians against him on how to destroy him. Now, in this sequence, Jesus is the interrogator and the Pharisees are left to answer. That's kind of odd. Now, it's this last portion that I'm leading us to. So we already see there's a difference in the way the questions and answers are. The first four times, Jesus is the one being interrogated. The others are now the, one, are the ones questioning. In this last one, he turns the tables. In the last couplet, instead of asking the question, the Pharisees and scribes surveilled Jesus in order to entrap him, and they wanted to accuse him. Jesus does not wait for the entrapment to unfold, though. Instead, he boldly provokes his accusers. He questions them. He interrogates them. He taunts them, even. And then as the text reads in verse 5, and this is where I'm headed, he looked around them with anger. He, even before he heals the man, he was grieved, it says, at the hardness of their hearts. Now the answer by his accusers to Jesus' interrogation is silence. Then they went out and immediately conspired with the Herodians against him how to destroy him. According to Mark's gospel, Jesus sealed his fate on the cross when, in anger, he provocatively turned the tables on his accusers because of their hardness of heart. There's a lot here, but first permit me some introductory thoughts. I believe that much of our confusion regarding understanding the New Testament take on anger comes from the fact that we have derived our understanding of who God is from sources more Hellenistic, more Stoic, more pagan in tenor than they are Christian. We must realize that many of the Greek philosophers of antiquity envision God as an immovable mover, an impassable person, the being who does not change, the one without emotion, a cold and calculated deity of pure reason, personified by logic that was mostly devoid of mystery. In such a scheme, of course, reason becomes most celebrated as a quality, and, that it, and it's also set against emotion. I'm not at all convinced that this is a picture of who the biblical God truly is, but if it is, if I'm wrong, that has huge implications for us since we're exhorted repeatedly in the Bible to be like Jesus. Have this mind in you that was in Christ Jesus. Be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. We are to model ourselves after God, after Christ, after the triune God. As Christian ethicists Gush Gushy and Staston say, Christian ethics are to be Christomorphic. They are to be shaped like Jesus. Thus, as the logic goes, if it's true that God is pure, unfeeling, unmoved reason, and if Jesus is God and we are to be like him, we would do best to rid ourselves of all emotion, and that includes anger. We end up interpreting Paul's exhortations that we looked at a little bit before as calls to show no anger. And in the event we do, we fall into sin just by being angry. Emotion's bad. Anger's emotion. Anger is bad. Yet, Jesus expressed emotion. Remember, Jesus wept. Here we see Jesus is angry. So taking our cue from him, the Jesus who feels, clearly we need not idealize a calculating cold frame of mind as the picture of who we are to be. Anger feels, since anger is an emotion, and humans, thankfully, have emotions. As we look at Jesus, we see that it's okay for us to be emotionally moved, to have fun, to rejoice, to dance, and yes, even to be angry. Jesus looked around at, at them with anger, we're told. He was grieved at their hardness of heart. 
So how can we make sense of it? What about all the cautions against anger, the ones I listed at the start? In order to answer this, I'd like to step back and look over the last few weeks a bit. Not in a long way. I'm going to try and end on time. In week one of this series, we looked at the notion of vainglory, assisted by Dean, uh, Dean Brian Williams. I will summarize by saying that vainglory is an excessive belief in one's own ambitions, a posture that interferes with the recognition of the grace of God and one's place in that scheme. It often has been called the sin from which all others arise. Aquinas called it that. And it also frequently is known as vanity or pride. Vainglory or pride seems to me to be simply distorted self-respect. It is bad, but self-respect is good. Then in the following week, Dr. Diane Chen led us through an examination of the vice known as gluttony. I define this as an inordinate desire to consume more than what we, we require. It seems to be simply distorted appetite and enjoyment. And friends, appetite and enjoyment are not bad again. After all, Jesus sat down and he ate and he supped with his friends, even in post-resurrection form. Gluttony, though, is not good. In the following week, our own president, Dr. Ron Matthews, explored the concept of avarice with us. My own summary of that is a, a desire for material wealth or gain that ignores the spiritual quality and value of the material world. As we know, it's also known as greed. Greed is distorted, dis, it is distorted stewardship, or maybe even ownership. To be God's steward is a good and honorable thing. We're commissioned to do that. To be, cre to be greedy, though, is to go beyond and to distort that, to be insatiable, to not recognize limits. Then two weeks ago, Dr. Kaylee Johnson probed the notion of envy. Envy is a simply a longing for what others have. It distorts personal ambition and competition, qualities that are good when, they, when they're by themselves, but when they morph into envy, they become corrupting. In weeks that follow, we'll explore two additional vices. Theresa Noy will help us understand sloth, which can be kind of called laziness, the avoidance of physical or spiritual work that's appropriate. It distorts the notion of rest, of course. We're commanded and commended towards Sabbath. Sloth, sloth turns that into a vice. And finally, Dr. Darrell Pearson will guide us through an understanding of lust, and I expect the bleachers to be filled. Be an interesting sermon. Historically understood, lust is an inordinate craving for the pleasures of the body. It's kind of like what Apostle Paul called the flesh, or sex. It's, a, it's distorted desire. Now, desire, again, is good, but lust is when it overtakes its own purposes. Now, let's bring Jesus back into the picture and note something. If we look at the biblical materials, we can observe that the New Testament surely does not paint Jesus as a prideful person. Nor does it, do they depict him as gluttonous, though he was accused of being that sometimes. Jesus is not shown there to be greedy, nor envious, nor slothful. Certainly he was not lustful. But as we've just seen, the Gospel of Mark does describe him as angry. So in that way, we have to look at anger a bit differently than the other vices. Anger in, in its unrighteousness, in its unhealthy form, it appears when a person spurns love and opts instead for fury, for revenge, for self-righteous hate. In this form, it's often also known as wrath. So a curious fact about this vice is anger can be good, though. That is, provided it is brought under control. But under control to what? Well, we will return to that in just a second. Unlike the other vices, anger does not seem to be a distortion of a matching virtue a fallen good quality morphed into an evil twin. That's probably because, and this is a central point I'm trying to make this morning, because it is not always a vice. Sometimes it is not even regrettable. At times it's a good quality, not a substandard quality. Anger is unwanted when it, it's, when it itself becomes misguided. That is, when its focus or its goal or its target is misplaced, when it becomes unmoored from what should be its focus. This vice is so different that it seems to, for us to not be angry sometimes can be sinful itself. Since in those cases where we stand in the presence of injustice and we do nothing about it, we are neglecting our responsibility to be moved by another's misfortune. To be passive, to ignore injustice, to be unmoved, 
with no revulsion in the face of marginalization, that is less than human. It's a posture of injustice itself. We actually sin by not being angry in these cases. Such a passive position of detachment is often a stance of comfort, in fact, and privilege. Since persons who experience injustice themselves do not have the luxury of being so detached, they are unavoidably moved, often to tears, by the frustration and depression brought on by injustice. I propose that is what is happening in Mark 3, 5. We find Jesus looking around in anger in the face of misguided injustice, accosted by oppressive interrogation from Pharisees and scribes who are clueless what true Yahweh religion actually looks like. He becomes grieved by what he witnesses, specifically as it relates to the hardness of their hearts, a central theme in the Gospel of Mark. Especially before persons who are broken, body shattered, and reputation sullied. So how do we avoid this unmooring of anger, wrath directed at the wrong object, while still properly allowing anger to arise in the presence of injustice? How should we respond? Well, since last month was Black History Month, this is an opportune time to learn from one of our country's most celebrated exemplars of righteous anger. Of course, I'm talking about Dr. Martin Luther King. There are two very helpful vignettes that illustrate Dr. King's anger, ones that align with what I'm talking about here. The first vignette, I'm sure there's many, but I'll only pluck out two. We're told that when Dr. King was 14 years old in high school, he won an oratorical contest sponsored by a group known as the Negro Elks. After receiving the award in Dublin, Georgia, he encountered blatant racism that incited a deep sense of anger in him, and he described it this way. We were on a bus returning to Atlanta, he and his teacher, Along the way, some white passengers boarded the bus, and the white driver ordered us to get up and get the, uh, give the whites our seats. We didn't move quickly enough to suit him, so he began cursing us. I intended to stay right in that seat, but my teacher, Mrs. Bradley, urged me up, saying we had to obey the law. We stood up in the aisle for 90 miles to Atlanta. That night will never leave my memory, he said. It was the angriest I have ever been in my life. Then yet number two, a few years earlier, was when Dr. King was with his father, and he remembers his father's anger when a white sales clerk told his father that the two of them had to move to the back of the shoe store rather than being waited on in the front. Whereupon my father, he says, took me by the hand and he marched out of the store. This was the first time I had seen Dad so furious. That experience revealed to me at a very early age that my father had not adjusted to this system, and that, and that played a great part in shaping my conscious, conscience to the future. Dr. King will never forget the for anger he felt on the bus ride from uh, Dublin for the rest of his life. He was also deeply shaped by how angry his father became in that shoe store several years earlier. In each case, the anger went on to fuel his work for racial justice, and he was deeply spurred on by those memories in ways that made him strong, resolved, and adamant. Yet he, even though he continued to be aroused by those memories of anger, he did not allow them to morph into hate. He worked hard to avoid that. Anyone who knows his story knows how prophetically angry he could be, but that same biography also reveals an anger controlled by the power of love, by the power of reason, and by staying committed to nonviolence. Nonetheless, Dr. King's anger and his unwillingness to remain passive in the face of injustice caused him to pen challenging words like these. He said in Stride Toward Freedom, to accept passively an unjust system is to cooperate with that system, thereby the oppressed become as evil as the oppressors. Non-cooperation with evil is as much a moral obligation as is the cooperation with good. When we remain unmoved in the face of injustice, when it does not prompt in us anger, then that motivates us to be complicit in the evil that we've witnessed. What we have here is a hard and delicate balance, of course, but it's a balance that we must walk. Remember, the author of the Gospel of Mark boldly asserts that Jesus became angry. His was an anger provoked by injustice, by improper accusations, by the suffering of persons around him, by attitudes that caused his inquisitors to begin plotting his death in the third chapter of a 16-chapter Gospel. Anger is a proper emotion in cases like this, I, I think we're told, and that's why we see it in Jesus. But given the risks, how might we keep our anger on track? How can we keep it from deeply rooting into bitterness in our hearts, devoid of love, morphing into hate, unforgiveness, 
the very opposite of what we're supposed to be. Well, clearly, Dr. King struggled with that dilemma. I also believe that Jesus, fully God, fully man, also struggled with it. Remember, in Mark 9, he says, Oh, faithless generation, how much longer must I be with you? As I bring my reflection to a close, I'd like to offer a bit of a guide, and it actually started before I even walked up here. This is a guide that will help us respond properly in a, in, in to, with righteous anger, not forgetting love and self-control. Right here in chapel, by way of what we often come here to do, I think we have a clue. What might the clue be? The analog, I think, is worship. We all know worship to be a good thing. That is, provided it is directed toward the proper object, toward God. Remember, Exodus 20, the first commandment says, You shall have no other gods before me. Provided Israel worships this God, Israel worships properly. But as Israel became detached, when she ended up not moored upon God, she ended up as a nation idolatrous. But, guys, be careful. God did not then encourage Israel to cease worshiping because worship could lead her astray. Rather, Israel is to continue worshiping, but she must recenter on the proper object of worship, the God who saved her. Thus, worship must be lovingly attached to God and the poor on whom, whose side he stands. It must be relationally directed toward him and in response to fellow brothers and sisters in need of the community, since God is the God of justice. Worship must also be aligned with how God has acted on behalf of, our, of the human condition. Worship that is good is worship that is both loving and worship that is faithful to God's story. I believe we should properly approach anger in a similar way. We must recognize that anger can be good, desirable, even necessary, if it arises out of a love of God and a love of neighbor, especially in the face of injustice. In those cases, anger can serve a prophetic function. In those cases, we actually are called to be angry. But our angry anger will remain good and not embittering only if we take up a lifestyle marked by biblically aligned self-control upon God, focused on God, in a way that shows that we know who Jesus is, even the angry Jesus. We must be faithful to the God who saved us, to others whom we owe love, and to the story and the style of the one who sent Jesus for our benefit. At those times we find ourselves angry, we must ask ourselves, is this anger driven by love? Does it comport with the picture of love I have in Christ? Sometimes we cannot be anything but angry. Standing aside passively in the face of injustice is less than what God wants us to be. We will be found faithful, provided we are angry at the, angry at the right times, but always loving. Just as Rosa Parks had been arrested in Montgomery, Alabama, Dr. King stepped up to a podium to speak to thousands of people at Holt Street Baptist Church. Here's what he later said about what he wrestled with that day. How could I make a speech that would be militant enough to keep my people aroused to positive action and yet moderate enough to keep this fervor within controllable and Christian bounds? What could I say to keep them courageous and prepared for positive action and yet devoid of hate and resentment? Could the militant and the moderate be combined in a single speech, he asked. He told the crowd that there was only one weapon they could use and that was the weapon of protest, but not just any manner of protest. He encouraged them to protest in a way that was consistent with the teachings of Jesus. They were not only to head in God's direction, they were also to do so in God's way. This sort of balance is what we saw earlier in chapters 2 and 3 of Mark. Jesus, after being unfairly interrogated by an unjust system that oppressed the poor and ground down the weak, he looked around in anger, yes, in anger, and he resisted those who had just questioned him. He provoked, he resisted, he challenged. But he did so in love and in nonviolence and with self-control. We must be careful with anger. The Apostle Paul reminded us of that in the verses we looked at at the beginning. It can lead to irrational emotion and improper behavior, prideful responses, bitter actions, self-serving, and, th and that cause our, it can cause our love for others and to God to die. But we must also be careful about not being angry. Since anger is not only allowed at times, it is necessary when it encounters injustice. Let us love. Let us exercise reason. Let us be troubled. Let us even be angry at injustice. May we be angry, Paul says, but not sin. May we not let the sun go down on our anger so that we may not make room for the devil. 
This, my friends, is the pattern of Jesus. This is what we are called to do as well. Would you pray with me? We need to strike a balance as we often need to do in our Christian life, O oh Lord. We tend to swing from one side to another, sometimes predisposed by our own emotions and our own personalities. And that's good. But help us to look at you, to stay moral. Help us to not get full of pride and self-righteous anger. But help us to not be passively unmoved by the injustice before us and by the needs of our sisters and our brothers. Help us to be like Jesus, angry at the right times, but self-controlled in love and care for others. Help us with this balance.